celebrates the very best of the media industry. It's so special to be a part of that, thanks to you guys. We offer the public the opportunity to meet the cast, the directors, the producers, the creative teams behind the hottest new hits, and the classic programs we all remember. The Paley Center has always been a place where people come together to think, to laugh, and to watch and experience great media content with friends and fellow fans. It's a dynamic time in the world of entertainment. And it's a really exciting time to be a member of the Paley Center for Media. here and really want to welcome you to tonight's program, a timely uh, look at the power of political satire on television. Political satire has always flourished on American media, but exploded when Jon Stewart took over The Daily Show 20 years ago. TV satire continues to build upon the traditions of such pioneering commentators as Bob Hope, Mort Saul, and Johnny Carson, and such shows as Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In and The Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. Comedians now on all sides of the political spectrum not only make jokes, but they help shape our ideological landscape. As we head into the presidential elections, the Paley Center is gathering satirists from different generations and persuasions to discuss the potency of humor, to transform, transform politics, and perhaps the type of leaders that we elect. Our panelists will grapple with some really pivotal questions, including what makes for great satire, and does political comedy actually change anyone's mind? We have an all-star panel where we're pleased to welcome uh, to this stage a little bit later, Elaine Boozler, the first woman to have her own one-hour special on table, and many more. We will have David Cross, co-creator of Mr. Show and such comedy specials as Netflix, Making America Great Again. Felonious Monk, comedian, playwright, and social commentator. Dave Smith, New York-based comedian, radio personality, and political observer. And Liz Winstead, uh, co-creator and former head writer of The Daily Show and founder of Air America. Our evening will be moderated by Vincent uh, Cunningham, who is staff writer for The New Yorker, uh, writes especially on arts and culture. Before we uh, start our event, I just want to share just what is upcoming at the Paley Center. We encourage you to go to our website, paleycenter.org, or become a member. Uh, we have a great event Monday, December 9th. We are going to have a doc pitch competition. We have five aspiring filmmakers come and pitch their ideas to a panel of experts. It's always a dynamic evening. Uh, for tonight, we want to thank the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation for making this evening possible. We're so grateful to Executive uh, Director of the Foundation, Jean Korf, and Trustee Scott Korf. Before we begin, just a reminder to everyone, we encourage you to take photos and share your experience on social media. Use hashtag PaleyLive, but please, no photographing, no uh, 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 using flash photography or video audio recording or anything that appears on the screen. Also, we'll be live streaming our conversation, so you might want to alert your friends right now who are not here and tell them to go to our Facebook page. Before we meet our panelists, we should first take a look at some great highlights from the Paley Center archive, looking at political satire through the years.
thank you. I'd like to welcome our Facebook friends. They're joining us right now. And also remind everyone that this uh, event will be uh, archived on our Facebook page. So please share it with your friends. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator tonight, Vincent Cunningham. He has been staff writer at The New Yorker since 2016. He's written on books, arts, and culture for such publications as The New York Times Magazine, Vulture, and McSweeney's. And previously, he has served as staff assistant at the Obama White House. Please welcome Vincent Cunningham. First off, Dave Smith. Liz Winstead. Polonius Monk. Elaine Boozler. <laughs> and David Cross. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm so excited to, to talk to you all. Really? It's an honor yes. to win this award, <laughs> and I, uh, <laughs> I didn't know I'd be sharing it, but. Uh, <laughs> um, I'd love to start with just the, the name of our gathering here, about sort of political satire specifically. I wonder, I'd love to hear from all of you whether you, what's your relationship to the term satire, right? There are lots of different ways or to, be political and deal with politics as a, as a comedian, but specifically around satire, is that something that is part of your identity as a comic? How, did, does, how do you relate to that? Who are you asking? Whoever. <laughs> Dave, David, start, and then we can. All right, no, I was just going to say that I just realized how much my credits suck in that intro. But, uh, <laughs> you guys have created some really well. cool stuff. <laughs> Okay, so. <laughs> Please, yes. We're comedians. We're the town crier. And I, I'm surprised Lenny Bruce wasn't in that uh, uh, jumble because I believe he was the Big Bang. Mm. I do. He just blew. And, and then the earth and the planets formed. And, um, you know, he became the town crier. Comedy swings back and forth. Silly, hour through your head, then politics, then silly, then back. And this is the time where we need it seriously now because the MSM, mainstream media, is not doing its job. Uh, we have fake news Fox. And people on social media really say, don't leave because we need you, because the tops of their heads are coming off. And so I always did politics. And uh, now more than ever, I do now more than ever of it. Yeah. I think politics is personal anyway. And I don't think I've ever considered myself to be doing satire other than a, a couple of characters I've played on, on a show. But for the most part, um, when I talk about politics, I talk about it from the personal standpoint, right? All of these sure. big political issues that affect the world affect each one of us individually. That's why we care about it. That's why we get motivated to vote, right? So when, when I'm writing material, I'm not writing it so that I can get it to the biggest audience possible. I'm writing it from the most narrow standpoint possible, and it's from my point of view. And if I can explain to you how it affects me, <laughs> Personally, then maybe you can see how it affects you. But I call it the politics of everyday life. That's it. That's politics right. itself. Yeah. Does, doesn't it seem like, at least to me, it seems like today, everybody's more obsessed with politics than it than it used to be. Like it seems like it's more a part of everyone's everyday life. Like it, people are so angry about the latest thing. And as someone who is obsessed with politics all the time, I don't think it's good. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's better when most of you guys aren't paying attention. But I think there's like a that's, reason for that. There's a, yeah. uh, you know, there's, uh, we're in uh, time, the, the, uh, it, it's, the time we're in is exaggerated. It's, uh, it's um, for a lot of people, it's horrific. It's the, the literally the most polarizing time, and I've, uh, if you if you read recent history, it's always been polarized, uh, uh, but not like it is today. Because in part we have um, so many sources. There's there's a lot of noise, and there's so many sources of uh, information. Whether and you you now have to uh, be extra careful and judicious about uh, knowing the source and the source of the source and what's valid, what's not valid, and. Um, uh, and with social media amplifying that stuff, I mean, 
all that stuff, it's a, it's a perfect storm, as it were. And, that's, and, and I think I would imagine that everybody in this room, everybody who's watching uh, on social media um, or Facebook, uh, uh, f desires it to go back to what you were talking about, where it could just be one, two, three, four, five, six things that the president or Congress is doing that are outrageous and not, <laughs> not uh, six things per Hour. minute. You yeah. don't want to watch. It just won't leave us alone. It won't stop coming in. It's poltergeist. It's under the door. You don't want to watch. It finds you. It, I, I, the only reason I, well, I want him to lose for a lot of reasons, but the main reason is so I can go back to my life. We can't go back to Do our you, lives. This, this is our lives now. I, I, I get that completely, and I sympathize with that feeling. I mean, I, I agree with it. I wish we could almost like go back to a time when everyone wasn't obsessed with politics. But the more I look at it, I go, okay, so 2020 is coming up. There's basically two options or, or two possibilities of what could happen. Either Trump doesn't win, he gets impeached or he loses the election, in which case every Trump supporter, the 63 million people who voted for him, can say, well, it was, they never gave us a fair shot, it was a deep state coup, the media was against him, or, or whatever, and they can have their argument. Or Trump wins again. And the Democrat left side can say it was Russian interference, it was, you know, whatever, and they can have their side. Either way, I, I get what you're saying. I don't see it going back. It seems like the toothpaste is out of the tube and people are going to be upset and fighting and the country's just going to get more and more polarized. Shut up, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I feel like, and in both of those equations, one has more truth to it. Um, but I also feel like people got very invested in politics after this election. Mm -hmm. um, I would say I've been doing this since the 90s. And so it was smarter before people had hot takes just because they were mad that huh. Hillary didn't win. Honestly, I think the comedy got dumber. And a lot of the people that I saw on that tape would not let anybody on this stage. Mm -hmm. do stand up, work on a staff that had uh, politi politics in their monologues. Like that is all new because of one thing. And so I think that when we talk about comedy and politics now, um, it's interesting for me. I mean, part of the reason that I, I mean, I, I created a reproductive rights organization because I was on television doing politics, raising awareness, and the networks were like, you're not an activist. Right. So you can get people all riled up and be and, and I was like I don't want to be an anger fluffer if I'm gonna like point out things that I think are messed up I want to say and here's what you can do about it at least right? right and so I look at a lot of it as when you think about politics now what are you learning you know like Betsy DeVos you know Ben Carson Rick Perry up until 10 minutes ago have been doing really <laughs> messed up shit and there's no jokes about that, you know? So I feel like political satire for the past two years has been Trumpian and Trumpian alone. And it hasn't been particularly um, innovative or smart in breaking down like really issues of what we're talking about. No, I think Wait, so, can, I'm sorry, can I just say, I agree with you completely that I think the political satire has gotten worse and worse and well, dumber and dumber. I would just say it's dumber. comedy too, it's not even satire. Sure, but I agree. do you really think it's been pro-Trump? No. Like you think the political comedy no, has no, been no. pro Trump? That's not what I said. I said Trumpian focused on Trump. Centric. No, but I'm saying. Oh, okay. Maybe I misunderstood yeah. that. But you're saying nobody's been breaking down like the craziness or the evil. No, no, no. No, that's not what I said. I said the exact right. opposite. That's all they've been doing, and not the larger scope of politics, the system. Oh, okay. How My apologies. I, I misunderstood. Like the cabinet. Like yeah. a lot of stuff that's happening. You know, I mean, we have like 35 acting. Like people in the we like, yeah. I just feel like if you're in line for the president, it should be a temp job, right? Like I feel like you should you should no, be driving an Uber a couple nights a week and then they being have to like join a SAG and because they're all acting, yeah, and not paying any so, or anything. Yeah, I, I, yeah, we're, we used to learn a little bit, right? You used to learn a little bit, and now I feel like a it's a regurgitation of what all you guys said really smartly, which is with social media, with everything else, it is this relentless spew of hot takes, and after a while, it's like oh. My goodness. But also the comedy is, I think, particularly uh, vapid and, and weightless and, uh, and obvious and easy. And this is uh, since Trump's election? Is just yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, political comedy? Yeah. And uh, I mean, there are, are. I think there are exceptions. I, I think, think there, are, of course, there are. Oh, there always yeah. are. There are always ten great comics and a million bad comics, and it's been that way since the fifties. <laughs> it's what it is. Uh, well, there were there weren't a million comics in the fifties. No, but and, 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 there, <laughs> and there are. Of course. There are a million and com there people are now, on though. Twitter or whatever who right. call themselves comedians and who get listened to, <laughs> and uh, um, get validated. Um, Gee, who would that be? Hmm. But that's the that's the scarier part, though, is that because of social media now, it's not it's not the audience here making the decisions on who to listen to. It's someone who clicks and follows, and sometimes the brands don't know the difference between someone who's an influencer or someone who just people are following. So this guy has a hundred thousand followers, and they go, "Oh, this guy's important. We're going to bring him onto our show. We're going to give him our platform too, and we're going to validate him." But he's not saying anything, but, and no one. Is, but in line no with really that, watching him. In line with that, those. People are, um, and it's there are pros and cons to it, but they're uh, they're presenting themselves. Right. Nobody else is backing them. They're coming in, and a and a lot of what they are doing, because that's what works, is getting the most clicks, getting the most uh, retweets, getting the most, and and it's an easy thing to do, and it and it feels like it's about winning. This like, what yes. was comedy about winning? <laughs> Yeah. You know, right. about uh, shutting somebody down. I mean, yeah. well, comedy is always usually punching up. I mean, that's what it well, should be. Well, one would hope, yeah. Yeah, but, but I mean, I, I have to argue with your saying comedy is vapid now. <laughs> look, it's always going to be dick jokes and then the people who are actually artists. And if you go look at John Fugelsang or Christopher Titus, I, 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 didn't, I mean, they're great. I said a lot no, of it is vapid. Yeah, I, hold not, on, but yeah, yeah, first off, you're not arguing wrong, with me, yeah. you're arguing with my misinterpretation of what Liz was saying. Oh, so, yeah. there's. <laughs> But, uh, yeah. which I got wrong. But I don't, to be honest, I don't think comedy is about punching up or punching down. I don't think, I think comedy is, maybe this is a little hippy dippy ish, but I think it's kind of about bringing the room together. I think comedy mm -hmm. is about even the person who disagrees with you, whereas if you were to just make an argument, they would dig in and go, no, 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 I don't agree with that. But if you get something really hilarious, even they go, all right, you got me well, with that course, a little bit. So it's not even, does. it's well, not punching. It's political. I'm, well, I think, I'm talking about political comedy, not well, just comedy. Well, anything talking about politics is going to be talking about up, I guess, rather than down, because that's who's in political would. power. But I'm just saying that the, what I think the point that you were making was that it seems like it's more these days like bashing the other side. Like I'm on the left, I want to bash the right. I'm on the right, I want to bash the left. Rather than I want to make a room full of people who could be left or right all kind of go, okay, he's got a point. I, my, one of my favorite jokes ever, ever told, was uh, George Carlin, who's to me the greatest comedian who ever lived. Uh, and he did the joke about Muhammad Ali getting thrown in jail for not going to the war. And he, I'm gonna butcher this, but the, the joke was that he was like, Muhammad Ali had a weird job, it was uh, punching people in the face. The government said, you can't punch people anymore, you gotta kill people. And he was like, no, that's where I draw the line. And they said, well, if you're not gonna kill people, we won't let you punch people anymore, and threw him in jail. And it's such a brilliant joke that even yeah, someone who was an adamant Vietnam War supporter would go, that's pretty funny, man. That's like, and it's not about punching you as much as it is about like going like, okay, I see it from your perspective. How, however you characterize this change in tone, I do wonder for all of you whether, and maybe Liz, this is a great question for you because of your work, not only in TV, but in radio. I was thinking about that sort of, how much of this is medium dependent? We're here obviously at, in a sort of televisual institution, but it does seem to me that the content of comedy, but also its effects in the real world change depending on how it's delivered to people. Um, has that, is that, first of all, one, is that true? And second, if it, if it is true, how did, has it kind of ramified in your work? Uh, well, I think, you know, for it, on radio, it's, it's, you know, radio's a different medium because for me, I think radio, to me, in all the things that I've worked in, it is so much fun. Like, that connection with audience, you really do feel like you're talking to another person and you really have these connections. It's a very intimate um, form of broadcast. And so um, I feel like radio, it, it depends on where, it does depend on where you do it. If you look at John Oliver, for example, he's not on a network called Comedy Central, so he can tell stories, he can take you on this journey that's 25 minutes long. He can have comedy, he can make points, he can, he can go through a whole narrative where there's not a constraint of what a network that has comedy in it might hold of you. You know, mm -hmm. it's different. 
um, radio, you can be funny, you can be outraged, you can um, take a minute to be yourself. You know, good radio is a combination of your opinions, your feelings, um, and your openness to hearing what other people say, in my opinion. And I just, so I feel like, and I feel stand-ups like that too, I don't know. To say what comedy is supposed to be is always a slippery slope for me. Mm -hmm. Comedy is supposed to be, for me, um, the thing that I practiced and I, my compact with the audience is, I worked on this, I planned it, I care about it, I can't guarantee anything else after that, and that is my compact with the crowd. Well, co comedy is supposed to be funny. <laughs> I mean, that's, that, yeah, that is that. honestly the, uh, <laughs> I think people from any political spectrum would say that's the thing. It's right. supposed to be funny, you know. And again, it's the most subjective thing, hmm. um, you know, outside of like truffle fries. But it's it's uh, <laughs> you know. You don't like them? I don't like them no. Oh. <laughs> it's too much. It's too much. I did not know that this was an anti-truffle fry group. Uh, what do you mean you don't like truffle fries? <laughs> um, I think just to capsulize what David number two said, it's David Knight at the stadium. <laughs> I was going with Dave and David, but however it's you David would put numbers the too, that's good. I'll take it. <laughs> so David <laughs> two, um, it's, when I said punching up, I don't mean punching, I mean what you're talking about. Don't take it literally. And of course, it, you know, it's a spoonful of sugar if you want to get any kind of political a point made. It's not me against them, it's us against them, whoever they are, both sides. And I've been doing this since the 1800s, and the point <laughs> is, is that I always, always took both sides, which is why I always sold out in the South, in the Midwest. I always took both sides. This is the first time in my comedy life I cannot see anything to take the other side for. I can't see it, and it's a dilemma as a comedian. I think that, that as a comedian, one of the things we all start out wanting to do is, get, is to get booked, right? So a lot of people avoid political humor very early on because- oh, I thought it was to get laid. <laughs> <laughs> Two sides of the same coin. I'm married, I, I'm not allowed to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Elaine. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's a, the idea of trying to get booked. And, and I've, this has actually happened to me where they've said, no, we're not gonna book him for our club. So I've had a friend uh, suggest me to a club um, to headline. He's like, hey, I got this guy. He's, he's doing well in the Midwest. He's got a pretty big following, da 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 You should book him. And they said, yeah, Felonious Funk, we know who he is. I think he's too political for our audience, which is crazy because at least 20% of my material is about my penis. And there's nothing. <laughs> it's a very political But penis. is it left-leaning or right-leaning? It's a... Uh, <laughs> Good stuff. That's a good joke. That's a good joke. And Dave, so you know this, it is a centrist. <laughs> That's great, because my vagina's undecided. hi -yo! <laughs> And that's what comedy is, people. There you, you go! <laughs> this is the best day of my life. <laughs> Made this running bit with David Cross and Lane Booth. <laughs> <laughs> Bury me right now. Genital <laughs> comedy. No. no right. Hold your own. I'm sure you can hold your own. There you go. Uh, There's another one. <laughs> I try to. I, uh, I use both hands. I'm kidding. I'm not. I don't. I don't. It's too far. We've gone too far. We've gone too far. See, there you go too yeah. far. Speaking though of, of like of audiences and real, you know, whether it's clubs, whether it's people in the seats, I've it's weird. I can't think of anybody that goes around the country sort of alternately pleasing and pissing people off, other than politicians running for office and comedians. Yeah, us. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it has, has being on tour as a comedian, as, as a stand-up specifically, has that, does it, is it a process of learning as well as um, trying to make people laugh? Do you learn about the sensibilities of people in a way that you don't in other ways? Yes. There's a, I didn't know the Midwest existed in the way that it exists until I started touring small towns in Indiana and, um, the pay wasn't enough, if we're being honest. In places that, it, it, and it didn't matter what side of the coin you were on, it was just, we don't want to hear what you have to say. And because I went, of, oh, these places. You're black? Yeah, and it was like, these places still exist? This is 20, whatever. Um, Kokomo and Dan, I'm talking about you. Kokomo. <laughs> if you're watching from Kokomo, shame on your whole city. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, but it's, it's a, you do get to learn people. And what that, what that taught me was prior to the 2016 election, I knew that, these, that, that 63 million existed. I saw them, 
right? So we get in these, but we do get in these bubbles on the East Coast and on the West Coast and in, in large cities where we think that there's no one who thinks like that. And there is, and I apologize for doing that particular uh, accent, but that's how I think they sound in my head. Um, but you see these people who are adamant that, you know, the, the lunar landing is faked and this is happening and, you know, kids shouldn't eat this type of food because they'll get autism in their left ear. And, and, and you can't, I can't make a joke that they get. I can just fall down and that's funny to them. And once I learn that there's some audiences I'm not going to be able to figure out or I don't want to figure out, right? Um, then I just kind of focused on what's funny to me. But yeah, there's whole large swaths of the country that there's only one type of humor they're going to like, and they don't want to hear it from you ladies either. Well, I, was, I would argue with people. that only because I um, spend three months out of the year in places like Jackson, Mississippi, and, no, and <laughs> Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah. And um, I, if, you, if you advertise you will be there, then people will come, so and they, they want to hear the it. Audience exists in, in even those small towns. I know they do because <laughs> I've performed in them to sold out crowds. You know, there's yeah, cool yeah. people everywhere that want to hear the truth. They just need to know or want to hear what you have to say, rather, my truth. Or and and also conversely, um, to your point, um, I get protesters out my shows all the time. Yes. Anti-abortion protesters, dozens of them, stand outside my shows and scream because I am a person on stage talking. That's why the big finish for you, you get an abortion at the end of your show every night, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's really Such tough to keep closing. that going every show. Oh, she can you know, yeah. so sometimes in states where there's only one clinic, you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> well, so, yeah, but so I would say that it's, you know, but also like, and, and the thing that's really been tricky is, um, I, the, the, the way it's been really helpful for us over the past couple of years is by being able to do targeted ads on Twitter and Facebook to, be able to, to target specific audiences. And Facebook, about 18 months ago, um, put abortion and certain issues into the same political sphere to, it, as um, actually being a politician taking out ads. And so for me to take out an ad to do political comedy or to take out my show with my nonprofit, um, we had to give up a lot of personal information and stuff like that in order to take the ads. They get rejected, and they don't let you target specific um, zip codes anymore. Hmm. And so that is being super prohibitive about um, how you can target audiences in those places. And, it's a, and as people got, oh, isn't Twitter great? They're banning politicians from paying for ads. Oh, guess what they swept up? Climate activists, <laughs> um, immigrant activists, abortion rights activists. Um, into this wide swath, and How so been doing stand that's yeah. a really interesting. That's, no, that's that's a real okay. a good yeah, point. I knew uh, when when I Alex Jones first knows. got banned from uh, like Facebook and Twitter and all the platforms, and and people were like, well, he is pretty crazy. So I think it's cool he got banned. I knew like three people who worked for uh, antiwar.com who were just hardcore anti-war activists, not conspiracy theory theorists at all, and they all got banned too. And it's almost like when they make they were this close big to thing. Wars, well, and it's no, they had like nothing to do with Infowars. It was just in the sweep of, hey, we're banning crazy people. Also, these people who have been like against the wars through Bush, Obama, and Trump, they got kicked off too. Scott Horton, Daniel McAdams, a few people I know who are like, really, not hard right or hard left, just we shouldn't be fighting these wars in the Middle East. They, and that, the point you're making, it goes, you can kind of sell it under this banner of, well, we're banning political speech. Yeah. But then it kind of kicks out all these other people. You're like, that's not really what you sold this as. And it gets kind of, like, personally for me, I'd rather just see no internet censorship. Let's try to win of the course. conversation. The Whoever's out there, like, if somebody wants to go, oh, the Holocaust never happened, whatever. Of Let's course. beat them in the argument. Let's not kick people offline. Let's let them speak, like, beat free speech with better I, speech. I disagree you know with what I mean? that. Oh, man, when that. the Klan was going to march in Skokie, the ACLU fought for them to be able to march. It can't be That's, either or. It's free speech for that everybody. That was free internet. Yeah, that, that's, yes, but that's pre and pre Fox News. But so you disagree with me on that? I do. I, I disagree with if there's something that we know. Uh, the the Ku Klux Klan was an ideology, uh, and that's different than saying Sandy Hook was. Nobody died in Sandy Hook. They were actors, and there, it's a false flag uh, operation, and uh, and the government is behind it. 
and, um, and specific people, mentioning specific people. And then those people, and we've seen numerous examples of people who receive that information and then go murder people. And I think... You can censor people. And I, I, I just... But come on. I'm I sorry. Mean, you said people, I think. I don't that's I like, mean to cut you off. And you think. It, uh, I think you can censor uh, obvious uh, incendiary lies. Our jobs are to educate but, ourselves as citizens. And well, we failed. Well, yeah, but, failing on, people, but so, people are getting but So you're going to say, look, if you say someone could say this thing and then someone goes and kills some people, didn't that Hinckley guy shoot Reagan over Jody Foster or something yeah, like that? I mean, it's, people it's, do, people commit acts of violence. He didn't look anything up on the internet. He was... He, right, that's my point. I'm saying, like, you could, look, if you want to say, oh, we should censor lies, well, that begs the question, not the logical term, well, just it leads the to the question, who decides what lies are and what the truth yeah, I will. are? I'll I, know be looking, what, I know what a lie is. Well, I don't want you to Well, I'm sorry. You can clap for that. I don't trust you to be the overlord who decides what the truth is, and I don't trust anyone else, the government or any academics right. or anyone else That's to do right. it either. Like, I think, I think put it out there. It's, and by the way, it, it's the job of us, if we're talking about the job of, of political satire, if someone puts out something about how they don't believe, like, Whatever, Sandy Hook, kids died there. It's our job to make fun of that that's person right. until everyone goes, that or guy's ridiculous. So, yeah, and, that's, 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 and if there's some crazy person who hears it and goes and commits violence, the, the justification for that is the justification to shut down freedom of speech completely because someone could take it the wrong way. No, someone could take what I'm saying the wrong leap. way you're right now. You're making a massive leap. I don't leap. think he is, and I don't even like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're, I mean, you're I'm acting, punching down. But, you're, but, but that, is, that is presupposing that there is some sort of equal playing media that, that everybody gets equal footing to dispel the lie. And that just isn't the case. For all of us to make fun of Alex Jones versus the media behemoth that exists that perpetuates something that is an obvious lie, we don't have the... The, the ability for us to do that is, is we don't have that right now. Dave, let me, let me bring this uh, uh, idea in a, in a much uh, 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 micro way. So there is a group of people you're not aware of yet. You will become aware of them shortly, but you're not aware of them yet. And they, for whatever reason, don't like something you said. They, they may be aware context. of context. Okay. I don't, I don't know. I don't know that. All right. Then uh, they decide they take something out of context, whatever it is. Maybe they don't. Maybe they just uh, manufacture it wholesale. That you're a pedophile, that there, there was a child that you raped, a six year old boy that you raped behind a school. That was specific. Yeah. Uh, well, they, these things are. No, I'm are saying your, your, your example's okay. getting to me. It hit me. And then. And then these people, they're, they're, because of their influence, and nobody's checked them because everybody has the right to say whatever they want. There's no censorship. And now you're out of a job. No, there's you're, libel and slander, and you get to defend yourself. Yeah, good, good and if luck. you're innocent, that's not true. Yeah, good luck. True. Alex Jones has not been, it's been years. If Mr. Uh, guy in the White House there, I can't say what it is. Right, you let, know. Me, let me finish my point. Well, uh, I, I, I want to hear your, your, All right. Your, uh, Why just him? Uh, because he, I, could, he, I could rape a child. Okay. <laughs> Be a little bit harder, but let her go. Girl power. Uh, it's 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 called pegging. Anyway, uh, so and this is a wonderful talk on comedy sat satire. But I want to hear. So so your life is ruined. Uh, maybe in the point to to where you're suicidal because your 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 girlfriend or wife leaves you, your family disowns you, all based on lies because we have no censorship at all. Anybody is allowed, anybody, an individual, uh, uh, an organization, they're allowed to, to put out whatever they want. How do you feel about it? OK, that sounds like it sucks. But let me say this. You can always paint a picture of how terrible things could be if we had free speech. I mean, I, you're right. I mean, if we had free speech, people That's could say. That's an easy one. No, I get what you're saying. If we had free speech, people could say terrible things about me, and maybe other people would believe them. However, I, as uh, like the founders said, right? Which, was it Jefferson or one of the others? I would rather deal with the problems of too much liberty mm -hmm. rather than the issues of too little. 
of it. Okay, so you're right, but in the reality of, of hold on, let me just say this. Yep. In, the, in actual empirical historical evidence, what happens when you ban speech, right? You guys all know the, uh, you can't yell fire right. in, a in a crowded theater, right? right? For the greater well, okay. good. Fire, 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 fire. I just did it. So what, do you know where that Supreme Court decision came from? It was, it was against World War I anti-war protesters who were handing out anti-war pamphlets, and they used it to lock them up in jail. So you can all, like, actually to me, I'm more concerned with the danger of some authority saying, no, that's too far on the free speech. And it usually isn't, like you were saying, just slander or libel. It's usually something that's like a threat to the establishment, a threat to the power structure. So I'd rather just have somebody be able to say, hey, Dave's a pedophile, and then I can go, what evidence do you have of that? Right. And they have nothing. I just want to say and, that my evidence can that could now be used against me was a hypothetical. But they could make, right. yeah. It's but only hypothetical that I could rape a that. child. I really could rape I, a but child. But I also think, too, if that were the case, good luck like, with that. Um, you would have, the amount of money you would have to spend possibly litigating that. Oh, but that's also, but, but also, and the time. More, yeah. The time. But also, I think to the uh, another point, we live in a world right now where uh, cl people who do not believe in climate science are on television giving massive, with astroturf science behind them that people think is real, that are preventing like our world from getting better. You have people. And, and that becomes a reality and a truth. Should, should people who lie about science have the same credibility as people who actually know that our planet is going to be off the rails in less than 20 years? Why don't we go by, back to education in this country? That's where it all comes well, from. We have well, a duty to educate ourselves. If textbooks are being you made. You guys are talking about duties and things that okay, are. OK, forget duty then. Their <laughs> textbooks come out of Texas, OK, for the entire United States. While you're yelling at idiots talking about no climate change, the real work needs to be done on how things are made in this country. All of the United States schools textbooks come out of Texas. And the board of Texas that puts these books together is housewives and clergy and flat earthers. There are no scientists. Oh, but but no, the point is that really what we were all educated but, but in? Just a minute. Those are the textbooks that come around. Elaine, if you want to change that, if you want to change that, you have to vote. You have to vote. And That's you, right. Now you're getting now people are lying about candidates, and those candidates are who you want to affect right. some change are not going to be. If Lee Harvey Oswald knew this, he would have been shooting at the Texas Book Depository instead okay, of but, from but the also, Texas so, Book so, so as, as comedians with I'm, please go ahead and then I'll I was going to say, I think they're, they're both things can be true at the same time. We absolutely need better education, but the time that it takes to get that group, a whole, an entire generation educated enough, might not exist because climate change is such a real thing that's happening right now. It might not fucking exist in 20 years. And the messaging so, is over right, and, and over and over, and over again over. Right. in a powerful space I think that it's we don't pretty control. Hard. I think it's, it's pretty hard that, to call an innocent person anything horrible and not have them right. dispel it in a week. And if Trump was innocent, he would have walked right into those hearings and taken every question in the world, like Hillary Clinton. Clinton testified for 11 hours without notes. So that's By the way, this is I a huge, get, this is a huge, I, I'm please. sorry, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I get because David, America didn't buy it, they believed the lies. I by the way, I, I get David's point about saying if you were accused of something, it'd be very hard to prove that you're wrong. But if you also set this standard where you go, you can't say anything that's determined to be, you know, the, the wrong speech, it's very hard if someone accuses you of saying wrong speech to prove that you weren't wrong, in fact. So it, it, th that same dynamic is true on both sides. And what you're saying with, like, the, if somebody says something that's not true on climate change, okay, but who gets to determine what's true and what's not the true? Science. No, 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 no. The actual science. Hold on, hold on. I'm not. Do you guys think that a consensus of scientists are going to determine what a politician is allowed to say or not say? Okay, fine. Maybe we can get them all together and they can vote on everything a politician they is have. allowed to but, say. But you, oh. No, there's. They don't vote. They do research. I'm not. By the way, I'm not denying climate change. What I'm saying is that <laughs> if Bernie Sanders gets on stage and goes, climate change is going to make the world uninhabitable for our children. Does that now go, is he kind of getting at what you guys believe is the truth? Or does someone actually have to measure that and go, no, you know what, that was factually untrue, so we're not going to allow you to say that now. It's like, this is, this is a weird I world. I didn't say, first of all, I didn't say politicians. I said experts on climate are put in massive spaces, scientists and in and equal footing is given to them of people who are speculative amateurs who actually aren't experts on climate, and they debate. And, the, and that debate can be skewed 
in a massive media way that then in turn, the politicians take that information, the electorate takes that information, and they've decided they've been presented with a fucking moron and an actual scientist, and if the fucking moron gets skewed in a way and gets enough airtime, that becomes a fact. There are differences. Listen, I, I, I know. For the, for for the record, exists, I'm not saying no somebody question. should be shut down because they were they off by a decade. Right. That's not the misinformation. So when should they be shut down? And so I'm, I'm just asking, what right. are you telling me right now, liberals in this crowd, that you're saying scientific debate in general should be shut down if you don't like no. what somebody is debating a, on? Just, I'm just asking, what's let's, the hold on, let's hold on for a second. I think the because, standard is that yeah. one side is, a, is, is an idiot and doesn't know anything about climate change at all. They're not right. scientists, and this side is a scientist. And I think that's what we're not, we're not talking about this scientist has different facts than this scientist. We're right. talking about this guy is a librarian who read something on YouTube, and this guy is an right. actual scientist. Yeah. And the news, the, the news, the media, right? now is giving them both yeah, five minutes equally. to make their case. Yeah. This guy doesn't have a chance. He shouldn't be making a fucking case. He's That's not right. a guy. That's yeah, I know. So, I know. Okay, so I, wait, I'm wait, sure wait, a lot wait, of you guys wait, would wait, like wait, that wait, scenario. Wait one, second. But, wait one second. Just because like we could do this, we sure. could do this forever. For right. And it's a big philosophical field, right? But the question that I think we want to address is, OK, you have all these questions. Um, how do you go from being that you, anger fluffer, you said? That was a, a f fantastic term. How do you go from being someone who points things out, which tends to be the position of the comedian, right, mm -hmm. to, to making statements that might affect action? It does seem to be by starting a, an organization, whether it's about abortion access or animal rights, right? How do you, mm -hmm. to make that switch, does it at some point cease to be comedy? Or are they really, or do they, in some ways, is there a complementary space where you can be doing both of those things? Can I say something Please. to the very young people in the crowd who've only been doing this for 10 years <laughs> instead of 48? <laughs> 48 years. I love this country. I love Kokomo. I was the black person in the 70s <laughs> going on the road as a woman. And that when there before cable, there wasn't cable. So they hadn't seen women doing stand up, not a 19, 20 year old women doing stand up who came out with tight shirts on and looked sexy and were smart. And I didn't let Kokomo run me out of town. Fuck them. You if go back be, there. If, well, wait, you go back can I say there this, Elaine? You can't say you were the black all person. The, yeah, anywhere. I was say, with like, all due respect, be, yeah, like, with all due yeah. respect, that I I, you were the black person in Kokomo. You were. Uh, let me tell Kokomo you why was I was. I you weren't. There you weren't. You weren't. Excuse me, I'm using my white privilege to tell him what it's like to be yeah. black. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, but I, I'll say this. Kokomo, I think there's a difference between Kokomo running me off. I don't yeah. have a need to prove to Kokomo that I belong there. I fuck Kokomo. I, I, I have but wait a, a minute, shit ton of wait fans a minute, wait a minute. Places. Like that, that all, idea that I have to make it in Kokomo. Yeah, and okay. Yeah, so with then, 30, then people doesn't exist. I don't care that Kokomo I understand like what it. you're saying. I first of all, the reason I said black was my real hair is like this big and there were no picks in Kokomo in the 70s if you had to go shopping. <laughs> there wasn't a pick on the road, not Mississippi, not Alabama. I used to use forks, okay? They didn't even have it. So I'm just saying it was so regional and so closed and they didn't want to hear me. They didn't know what I was. I decided, I don't want to preach to the converted. What do you want out of your career? I, I don't want to talk to the, the, the band. I'm not playing for the band, man. I'm there to open it up so everybody can hear it and see it and, yeah, maybe change their mind. Yeah, I, I think for me the difference is I, I think we're, we're talking about two sides of different arguments and, and this side believes this and this side believes that. But we have to be very clear that there's some sides that don't believe I should exist. Not that um, they don't like what I'm That's saying right. or they don't agree. They don't want me to exist. When we talk about the K KKK, the KKK is not a different ideology than the Black too. Panther. They I may have hated Jews. I came off stage so in Louisiana a, okay. with a KKK card in my dressing room. They left a, a business card and it said, you have been paid a social visit by the Ku Klux Klan. Make sure the next awesome. visit is in business. And so Did you stay at the Klan's hotel? I, I didn't there you go. I, yeah, but it's I see my thing is the, the I'm not trying to convince the Klan <laughs> that I should be able to do comedy in their town. Fuck them. If you don't want me in their town, there are a bunch of other towns. I'm Keep there to convince the world town. that I can right. do whatever the fuck I want to do. And that's cool. And I, I want to win them over by making them laugh and like it. And after a black man fucking was killed, a black teenager was killed for looking at a white person. Your experience is not the same. Yes, I know. I'm going to get fucked on Twitter and Facebook for doing the black line. I know I'm already fucked tomorrow. No, but I mean, it's, it's just, fine. it's just like, I don't care. it's just like, it's just, it's just not, it doesn't behoove anyone to, to 
try to silo out. All that. I was saying, and forget the black thing, I, I know I'm already eating shit tomorrow, so fine. But what I meant was they hadn't seen a woman either, and a young woman who was trying to be sexy and funny and smart, and it was just anathema to them. And I, I wanted to change everything. My goal, I mean, what's your mission statement as a comedian? My mission statement as a comedian is really simple, and it's, it's probably not as lofty as all of yours. Mine is, I want people to leave feeling better than they came in. I don't advertise to people I know are gonna come see me. I advertise to everybody else. I want them to come, I want it open. Were, were there women in your audience? Of course. Were there black people in your audience? No. Yeah. All right. So. Yeah, I, <laughs> exactly. Well, there were um, black people in my audience, so. But to, to answer your question about how you, how you, yeah, please, please, and then yeah. we're gonna yeah, move on to Q and A. I've gotten the sign on this happy note. Right. Not, no. So to answer <laughs> your question about how do you bring it all together? Yeah. Um, I'll just tell you one way. How do we way. bring this all together? No. How do yeah. you, no. So there's you can you can people who hear great comedy they. They love to come, they will come in for an experience, right? So what we do is a comedy show that is a really great comedy show, and then afterwards, we have, I have a conversation with activists in that town and people who provide abortion in that town. And our audience hears about what's happening and what's at stake in their communities, and then they can sign up with the activists to learn um, how they can actually participate. So you don't have to separate things out. Sometimes you can just be hilarious, get people in a room and use comedy as the uh, device, mm -hmm. and then have conversations like this, but in my case about access to abortion. Um, and you can really make a difference because sometimes we talk about the us and the them, and sometimes there's a giant swath of people who really don't understand how profound certain issues are in communities. And so to be able to raise that up, especially as we go back to this time that where impeachment and Trump is all that's on the news all the time, <laughs> to be able to bring another issue and to have people say, to say, I know this is what you're seeing constantly, but this big thing is happening and it matters. And here's some ways that you can actually help in your community. That's how I do it. And it works. Great. Thank you. We've only got five minutes left, so we might only get to two or so questions from from the audience that I have here. Um, and maybe this has some valence to the themes that we talked about. Um, do you feel that the way political satirists, or even just comedians broadly, treated Trump in 2015 and 16 before he was elected, i.e. not seriously, um, helped to contribute to a sense of resentment that helped him get elected? Look probably. at how the other candidates Pro talked probably. about him. Probably. They said worse things than we did. Yeah, Sorry. I, I, no, but probably. I think that probably had something, I don't know how huge, but it was a cumulative effect of distancing people and uh, uh, making, and, and also uh, with what Elaine was saying, like uh, uh, people on TV, and it, and it steeled a lot of those people uh, um, who were predisposed to not liking, you know, East Coast comedians or whatever, or, or you know, uh, Jew run Hollywood or whatever to feel like this is their champion, you know? Yeah, James Comey got Trump elected. That's what happened the week before when he oh. opened a new investigation into Hillary a week before. All right. Why is it the, com it's not to blame comedians for making fun of Trump and getting Trump elected, to me is utter bullshit. It goes back to why was The Daily Show successful? Because the media was garbage. Who, who made yeah. the most fun of Trump? Actual news. Actual news really were the ones that made that guy, Ill oh, he's a joke, he's a thing. Watch Morning Joe. Every fucking morning they did it. And, it be and it's so comics, it goes back to David, it goes back to all of us. A comic's job is to be funny. And so we're supposed to make fun of him. The media is supposed to bring who this person is and, truth. and, and yeah. do that, and they didn't. I don't, I don't think it was a reaction to, to comics, I mean, maybe minimally, but I really do think that it was a big reaction to the entire like corporate press, all of Hollywood, academia, the Democratic establishment, the Republican establishment, mm -hmm. all said, this guy's a joke, and to me, Trump getting elected was a lot like, it's like if you were, oh, well, okay. he was elected. No, um, he, no, okay, okay, please, 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 please. Yes, no, I get, get I'm aware it. he didn't win the popular vote, but no. check the news, he was elected. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're all yes, aware yes, that yes. that happened. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, okay, finish, yeah, so uh, I'm just saying that it's kind of, to me, it seemed like 
If you're right, getting though. jumped by five people, let's say, and you go to swing, like you're going to get beat up. No matter what happens, five people are about to beat you up, but you go, let me just swing as hard as I can and hit one of them. Yeah. I felt like the people who supported Trump wanted to just someone who is going to piss you off. Mm. And that was, and, oh, and a lot of that them whole liberal him. tears thing and people yes. like, I'm going to wreck my, off, I'm going to throw all my shit in the yard and set it on fire because they advertise on, Yes, you know. and, and I also think that Trump, look, my personal take is I think Trump is more or less a con artist. Yeah. Um, more or less, more. more. <laughs> all right, man, you guys like, I understand what side you're on, but just hear me what I'm saying. See, this is the problem with liberals in general. Oh, 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 I agree I, with you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, 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 wait. No, don't get offended by this, my sentence without letting me finish. This has been a hilarious night of political satire. We just got our... We, oh, I get cut off there. Oh, God. Come on. At that moment... Can you show him the sign, please? All right, okay, all right. Okay, please, fine. go ahead. What's, the, what's wrong with liberals? What's, <laughs> that, that just seems what's, like a weird moment to cut me off. I'm just saying, even if I agree with you 90% of the way, you go, whoa, more or less. I'm saying he's pretty much a con no, artist. I'm disagreeing with but you. But my just... I'm saying to say I think he's more a con artist, or less but at con least artist he is did like saying Hitler right. was more or less a mean guy. Yeah, you're right. Trump's the same guy as the I guy who fucking genocided my grandparents. Yeah, that's right. Because of what she's saying. I will say, cheap comparison. Whatever, man. I will say that we ignore this a lot. Take us out, man. More or less anti Semitic. I will say that we ignore. Yes, that's the same. More or less. Or whoever you think did it, we have ignored the fact that a bunch of people were disenfranchised. A lot of people didn't vote. And we say they didn't show up to the polls. Well, a lot of people didn't have an opportunity. We know 300,000 people in Georgia were taken off the road. We know in Florida, they just gave uh, in inmates the right to vote again, and now they're making them jump through hoops to get that. What we have in this country is an opportunity for people. We, we call it a democracy. Everyone gets to vote. But the truth is we know that not only does everyone not get to vote, but some people are actively prevented or they try to That's prevent right. them and suppress true. votes. That so the true. reason Trump won is partially for that the and courts. bigger. Yeah. Yeah, oh. automatically. But not comics didn't do that. Turn 18, there you go. And then we'll see what a democracy Well, this was hilarious. Is. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> that was fun.